Hi there, and welcome to today's lesson, uh, ostensibly for BCIT, Technology Teacher Education, TTED 4044, our final uh, project of the year, and we're going to be looking at the tethered electric airplane. Uh, this is a project that uh, might be of interest to lots of people, even if you're not in the class, because it's a great thing to do, a fantastic uh, technology education project for high school students. And what do I mean by that? Well, this is a tethered electric airplane. And as you can see, um, you build an airplane and you fly it on a tether using electricity. So that's why we call it the tethered electric airplane. Uh, and I've got more videos of planes flying around. We'll take a look at them later on. But they can go very fast. They can go very slow. They can carry a heavy weight. They can do all sorts of interesting uh, things that airplanes do. And it's one way that you can bring aviation indoors into your classroom. Uh, so anyways, uh, to introduce you to this project, I'm going to uh, base my first lecture on a presentation that I gave for the BC Technology Education Association Conference in 2019. And at that time, I was sharing the uh, pleasure of doing the presentation with my buddy Todd Ablett. Todd and I uh, went through the BCIT Technology Teacher Education Program together and uh, have very much enjoyed working together over the course of our careers and uh, anyways this was one of the first projects uh, that we did together uh, we did it while we were students at BCIT and we got to try it out with some students at Vantech thanks to Dan Fruing uh, who was teaching there at the time being willing to share his students and uh, this is what we looked like back in the day uh, you'll notice that top of my head didn't reflect quite as much at the time and uh, Todd was really a great mentor uh, for doing aviation things because he'd flown radio control quite a bit and I was really interested in it and uh, these were some of the uh, radio control planes that we built uh, as students at BCIT and uh, this little bundle that he's holding in his arms right now is probably older than some of our current students. Uh, that time goes by really fast. Uh, down here at the bottom, this beautiful DC-3 is a plane that he built and flew in the um, Canadian Radio Control uh, Championships when it came out here to the West Coast. And I think got a really nice shot of it here out at uh, the Pitt Meadows Airport. Uh, anyways, um, in the 24 years that we've been doing this, uh, some new technologies come along and we've revised and changed and modified and updated this project. And we've got amazing feedback and innovation, not just from the students at BCIT, but from the teachers across British Columbia who are doing this project with their students. So as I go through here, I'm going to be bringing in lots of ideas and suggestions, and I'm not claiming credit for all of them. In fact, I'm not even claiming credit for the original idea of this project. Todd and I picked up the idea off of the cover of a, a uh, educational uh, supplies catalog where they had this El Cheapo setup that they were charging a fortune for and we took that idea and we kind of ran with it and evolution has led this project off in all sorts of different directions so I hope it's something that you'll find some inspiration for and might uh, be able to work into your teaching. So anyways, things that have come along in the last uh, 25 uh, years or so since we started doing this is that uh, all of a sudden there's this thing called CAD solid modeling. We really didn't have access to that. And uh, CAD solid modeling works really well with 3D printing, which didn't exist at the time. Uh, laser cutters, there were none of them back in the day. And uh, even the ubiquity and the availability to get into computational fluid dynamics and actually do real analysis of your parts uh, and have virtual wind tunnels, that's coming down the pipe. And while it's maybe not quite at the scale where we're going to be using uh, engineering grade analysis in the high school classroom right now. There are some apps and that that are getting pretty close to that. And the other really cool thing is that cameras and video are everywhere now. Everything that you'll see in this presentation was taken in the last five or 10 years because we really didn't document our projects when we were starting out just because it was a pretty onerous project uh, task to uh, gather video and gather photos. You had to pay money for film and things like that. And if you took out your phone and tried to take a picture, you'd just get a dial tone. So anyway, um, uh, new technologies come a long way. We've still got a lot of old technology tucked away 
in this project, okay? Uh, we're using power supplies. And if you're a Vancouver school board teacher, you've got this giant gray power supply sitting in the back of your shop and you're like, what the heck's that? That's straight out of the like 1950s or 60s. And it's awesome for doing this because those things have so much current. Um, they weigh about 50 pounds. They're awesome, but we can do it with more modern power supplies too. Um, the electric motor, the physics behind an electric motor, a DC electric motor have not changed. We can get them cheaper now. They're mass produced in much greater quantities, but the way they work, the way they're controlled is still the same. And for cutting our, um, for, for cutting our styrofoam, for making the wings, a hot wire cutter is basically a big honking resistor. And it gives you a chance to go in and talk about resistance and power and uh, all that kind of stuff with your students, all while doing something really cool and cutting up little pieces of styrofoam that will be left sitting around in your shop, leading you to talk about many lectures about the necess necessity for cleaning up after oneself, something that hasn't changed over the course of the decades. Uh, we're gonna be using wood, steel, foam, metals, uh, so amongst all the new technology and the exciting things that have come along, there's a core of solid technology education content going on in this project. Um, some internal concepts, other than just clean up after yourself, kids, uh, is that we've got uh, the DC electric motor power curve. And this doesn't just apply to the tethered electric airplane, but you're going to see us using it a lot, particularly in electronics, where we're talking about robotics, one of the newest and highest tech applications of technology education in educational challenges and competitions. And so it's really important to understand a little bit about how uh, power and torque and voltage and current are all related in a DC electric motor. Uh, we're also going to talk about aerodynamics. Uh, big deal whether you're into bicycling or baseball or anything like that. Uh, how golf balls fly through the air is tied into things that we're going to be uh, studying in here. And certainly the physics of flight, lift versus gravity, center of lift, center of gravity, thrust versus drag, those actually come back to the component vectors that apply to all of physics and structures where, in this case, we started the course looking at statics and how things behave when they don't move. Those same concepts of a vector here and a vector there, a torque there, a moment there, uh, those all apply right in here too. So it's it's a pretty good tie-in for people who are uh, interested in understanding how the world actually works. Now, as you saw, we built radio-controlled airplanes and it has gotten incredibly cheaper to build radio control airplanes. And oh my goodness, drones are everywhere right now. Why would we want to build a tethered electric airplane? Well, a couple of things. The first one uh, that certainly hasn't changed in the decades is price. And batteries for your radio control airplane or your drone or whatever you'd like to build are expensive and heavy, okay? If you take the power supply off of whatever it is that you're flying, makes your planes much cheaper and much lighter. And it also greatly simplifies your flight. Now, if we take a look at uh, this lovely airplane right here, you can see the three main axes that uh, airplanes have to deal with. And they're referred to as pitch, uh, how your airplane tilts up and down. So whether your nose high or nose low, your roll, so as you bank into a corner, and your yaw, which your rudder would control, sort of swinging you side to side uh, if you kept your axis perfectly flat. Now, if we hook up to a tether line, that tether line runs right out underneath this wing right here. Okay, so you will attach our tether right here. We don't generally have a swept wing. We tend to have a straight wing, so it would be more coming down this central uh, axis. And uh, so it's going to be tied on right here. So now all of a sudden your plane cannot roll and it cannot yaw because it's being pulled inwards continually by this point right here. So all we're worrying about is pitch. And believe me, based on what I've seen, one axis to worry about is more than enough for the novice pilot. 
takes some while. And once you get that figured out, and once you get your tethered electric airplane flying, and you've got an understanding of pitch roll and yaw and control surfaces and center of mass versus center of lift, and you figure out how to keep a tethered airplane in the air when you're just fighting one axis of instability, well, then maybe you do want to go on. And certainly I've had students go on and build radio control planes and get to learn about dealing with three axes of instability. And who knows, there are teachers out there in the province who are planning to and who have built uh, home-built airplanes with their students and taught them to fly in them. Uh, takes, takes a bit of planning, but really when you're, uh, w when you're teaching technology education, your imagination is often the limits. Um, Founded, of course, by your ability to organize, fundraise, and do all sorts of interesting things like that. Um, so the key behind this project uh, is the tether pole. And without a simple and easy to manufacture tether pole, doing this project with your students would not be uh, that practical. So uh, I think this is about the simplest and most durable design we've come up with so far. I look at it and see ways that it could probably be improved and maybe it's time to move on to version five or version six and tie in some of the 3D printing and laser technology that we've got available to us right now. But this is a straight derivation, three or four uh, links down from where we started uh, back in the back in the early days of BCIT. Uh, so what we've got right here is these two wires come straight to our power supply. So they run down there, they run off um, uh, about 20 feet of cable, and they go to our power supply. And our power supply is designed to give a high voltage at a fairly low current so that we don't get a lot of resistance in these wires. Running off of a battery in this project is more challenging. We'll talk more about that later on. Uh, but anyways, as the wires come up here, you can see that this one wire deeks right into a hole drilled down the center of the dowel right here and pops up right over here, flips around and comes down and is press fit onto the inner race of this bearing right here. Uh, the press fit part's important. I haven't been able to get a really good solder connection on there. So uh, being able to press fit that on there is a pretty important thing onto the inner race. Now these bearings are stainless steel ball bearings, um, not a great electrical conductor. You can build a better slip ring than this. But because we're not moving a lot of current, we're not worried that much about the resistance in here. We're mainly concerned about getting voltage and a little bit of current out to the motor, a couple of amps. So uh, these bearings actually work okay. So as the electricity, say the positive electricity is coming up this way, it could be ground on this side for all that we care, but let's say it's positive, it comes to the inner race right there. The bearings on the inside are conductive. Now it's a good idea to use an open bearing or something that you can go through and clean all of the lubricant out of there because the lubricant is an insulator and uh, it also puts drag on the bearing while it's spinning around. You want something that spins very, very uh, freely and very, very easily because uh, you're not gonna have a lot of force pulling this around. So you need it to spin easily. The electricity comes through the bearings in the middle to the outer race of the bearing where I've used a hose clamp to connect a wire right here. And this wire gets strain relieved right here. The strain relief is critical to the uh, durability of your tether pole and the strain relief goes out to the airplane. And down on the bottom right here, well, if this was power up here, the ground comes in and pinches right in here and then uh, goes through the bearing, comes out here to another cable. You can see that connected right there. And so you've got power and ground going out to your airplane in a strain relieved manner that can keep rotating around quite a bit. You'll notice that I've got excess wire stored right in here. This allows you to have a little bit of adjustment in the overall length of the tether without having to go and change cables or uh, change cable lengths or anything like that. You could build uh, a nice strain relieved adapter right out here so that you can have your five foot wire, your seven foot wire, your 10 foot wire, or whatever you want. But um, anyways, the trick behind the tethered electric airplane is having a tether pole. Uh, the power supply, as I was saying, is also important because we want to be able to deliver fairly high voltage at relatively low current. Now we're using brush DC motors, not brushless, so we don't need a brushless speed controller, but I'm sure there's somebody out there thinking, well, 
brushless is better. We could make brushless and the price of brushless motors is coming down. So it's quite possible that there is a better solution out there in the way of brushless. But for now, um, this power supply right here that you can pick up for 150 bucks at Lee's Electronics uh, seems to work pretty well for us. Now, I made this presentation a year or two ago. They may have updated their stock numbers and the links might not be perfectly up to date. But uh, anyway, um, the key about this is that you want to get at least two or three amps uh, uh, from your power supply. I think these ones go up to five amps. And you want to be able to get 30, 32 volts or something like that out of your power supply. Uh, we're going to be running with motors that are optimized for higher voltage. And like I say, that's because you can use higher voltage to transmit power through your wires without having to uh, use higher currents. Batteries tend to be designed for higher current, and you do start to run into problems if you try to use a battery instead of a power supply. You also want the power supply to be a variable power supply so that you can turn it up and turn it down, because as you do that, you control the thrust to your motor or the power to your motor, which changes the thrust coming off the motor, which is uh, certain extent controls your pitch, which controls your ability to take off, maintain level flight, and then come in and land. Uh, so you're going to need some open space. Uh, and uh, a lot of times, if you've got shop space, that's great. You do need a relatively smooth floor because on some of the uh, kids' takeoff runs, it's going to take a full circle for that airplane to go all the way around, and it's going to be down on the ground. So if you've got uh, automotive hoists or that in the way, you may run into a problem. This is actually something good to do in a larger open classroom space or lecture space where you can move the desks out of the wall, and then you can actually tilt the desks on the side to form a protective barrier um, in part to keep the airplane inside the protective barrier in the event that the tether wire breaks or something goes wrong or the prop shatters, but also to keep the students out because certainly with uh, the grade 9 and 10 students that I did this with, there's some excitable young people in that class who see a shortcut to get to the tool that they want and they think it's um, a fun and interesting challenge to run through the middle of the uh, uh, ring while the airplane's flying. So you do have some classroom management to think about and certainly putting up barriers, uh, even if it's just having a ring of desks around here to keep people from running through here can help with your classroom management a little bit. Eye protection is another thing. Uh, these planes, some of them are going to be going very fast and the propellers are all going to be going really fast. and think of the propellers as a rotating power tool. That's what they are, a high RPM power tool. And no, there's not a lot of mass there, but the stored energy in your propeller when it breaks, EK equals one half MV squared, okay? Remember, that's your kinetic energy formula, and that V squared in there means that you can have a very tiny little mass at a very high velocity, and that's way more dangerous than a big mass at a low velocity. Okay, well, if you get squashed by a piano. Um, that's a different thing. But uh, high mass, uh, low mass, high velocity, we know that's dangerous. And so eye protection is really going to be a big thing. And classroom management, work on the taking turns. Uh, everybody wants to fly, but it's quite possible that when you do this with a class, you'll only be able to have one tether pole set up. All right, let's take a look at what you're actually going to do for uh, creating the propeller because the propeller is the gearbox of the plane and it's uh, it's really critical for getting things right. And so you're going to hear me refer to some terms as I talk about this, uh, one of which is the cord. Okay, so if we take a look at the propeller and how it spins through the air, their leading edge is what hits the air first and that kind of grabs the air and pulls it along the uh, length of the, the blade. Actually, each of the blades of your propeller is an airfoil, or like your wing, onto itself with a custom design shape designed to get the maximum thrust out of that um, ro each rotation of the blade. The diameter, of course, as you make your propeller larger in diameter, you're going to require more torque to turn it because you're going to have a greater distance from the center of the uh, propeller, from the hub, out to the tip of the blade. And as we know, when we try to lift something up and it's way out at the long end of our arm, 
that requires a lot more torque or force right back here. So if you make your propeller blade too long, then you're going to need a lot more torque. You also have to worry about that because that blade is going to be rotating through a much larger circle and each revolution of the prop, it's going to interact with more air molecules. So you've got more going on there than just the length. You've also got the circumference that it navigates. So you have to keep these props fairly small because we have a relatively low torque motor driving them. Uh, and when we get more into it and take a look at the electric motor power curve, you can sometimes see that you can actually get more power using a smaller propeller than using a large one. And you can kind of think of that, like I say, like the gearbox. If your prop is too big, then that's like having your gearing too steep. And those of you who drive standards uh, know what it's like to try and start in fourth gear. It's not really good for the clutch, uh, let alone the engine or your personal self-esteem. Uh, okay, the um, the number of blades, um, well, one is theoretically most efficient, and I have seen one-bladed propellers fly, uh, but uh, they're a little off balance sometimes. Uh, the uh, other terms on there, the pitch of the propeller, uh, think of it like the pitch of a screw, the number of uh, threads per inch, okay? Each time you turn a screw, one revolution, it goes a certain distance into the material. And really, one of the original names for a propeller was an air screw, and that's how our propellers should be behaving. They should be behaving like a screw, and every revolution, the pitch of the propeller, is how far it will progress through the air. Okay, Make your pitch too steep, and you'll stall the propeller. You just won't be able to grab enough air to move it along. Uh, but make it too shallow and you won't get enough speed to get your airplane up in the air. So you're going to have to tweak and play around with the pitch, the diameter, and the cord of your propeller to get them uh, working nicely. And the key thing to getting them working nicely is that they have to match the motor and they have to match the power supply. Okay, Because if you have uh, if you require too much torque, you'll limit the power supply on current before you get up to your maximum voltage and you'll never, never achieve your maximum power. You'll know you've got it just about right when your power supply is running right at its current limit and right at its voltage limit. So if you've got a 30 volt limit on your power supply and a 5 amp limit on your power supply and you're running at 30 volts and 4 amps, that's 120 watts that you are got available to the motor. But if you're running at 30 volts and 5 amps, that's 150 watts that you've got available to the motor. Now, whether the motor is using it efficiently or whether the propeller is using it efficiently, different question, but uh, try and tune it in right there. So props, as I say, are really important, and here are some props that we have known. When we started doing the project, um, the we, we'd use a piece of dowel, and we'd use a machine lathe, uh, go into the metal shop and you know, look around, make sure the metal shop teacher's not too upset about us using uh, a bit of wood on the machine lathe. We'd always make sure we cleaned up the wood dust afterwards so that it didn't absorb the oil and uh, let, leave the lathe prone to corrosion or anything like that. So always do a neat job when you're uh, sneaking in and doing things like this. But uh, then we'd use um, actually two liter pop bottles or one liter pop bottles uh, because the plastic on the edge of the pop bottle had a nice curve to it. And you'll see in the write-ups that come along with this some more examples of how we went about doing that. And uh, anyway, then uh, what we do is we would use epoch, we'd cut little grooves with a hacksaw right along here to control the pitch. And then we'd use epoxy to glue the little propeller blades in there. And it was good because it was inexpensive it required fine manual skills, and it kept the students busy for hours. So uh, anytime you can get students enthusiastically working on something that helps develop their fine manual skills uh, and that really doesn't cost you very much, that's a win for the shop teacher. Uh, sometimes we'd reinforce them with a little bit of tape, didn't really work. And, well, I've got to say these props did work, and this one right here was probably one of the an example of one of the nicer evolutions uh, of that. And uh, once I let my BCIT students loose on this, however, they started to come up with all sorts of innovations, being the uh, bright and talented people that they were. And actually, I don't know who came up with the 
who was the first one to take a bolt and chuck it up on the lathe. And you can see the head of the bolts back on this side right here. And they just drilled it to the exact perfect diameter that they could do a press fit of that bolt onto their motor. And once they press fit the bolt onto their motor, well, then they could put their prop on over top of the bolt. And then they could tighten that up with a nut. And you can see the nut right here. This is going on to a bolt that has had a center drill drilled uh, not all the way through, but far enough through and at just the right diameter so that you could use an arbor press to press the bolt onto the motor shaft. Now, when you do that, be really, really careful that you support the opposite end of the motor shaft, okay? Don't let the motor sit on its terminals and uh, uh, rely on its terminals. You will crush the motor that way. And if you do bend the shaft, your motor's pretty much dead. So be cautious that you've got the hole in the bolt. Just big enough, uh, usually a few thou old over, if I recall, a couple of thou over diameter uh, in order to get a nice interference fit. Uh, and then uh, the students also started getting into different ways to make the props. And this was one of the uh, first 3D printed props that we got. Curtis made it. Hi, Curtis. Uh, and uh, you can see that it looks really good on here. Now, the catch with 3D printed props is that, and I'll talk more about them in a moment, but you do have to watch that uh, when they hit the ground, and they will hit the ground, is that the PLA tends to be a little bit brittle. And when you have a high speed brittle object hitting the ground, you tend to get a whole bunch of high speed brittle particles flying around. So if you're using 3D printed props, eye protection is even more important than when you're using anything. It's always important in this project, but uh, anyway said my piece. Now this one right here was vacuum formed. And uh, again, I wasn't 100% sure that it was going to work. It worked brilliantly. Okay, and while you're looking at some of these, you can probably see uh, the quick and easy methods we, we've used um, to, to connect things here. Instead of a styrofoam fuselage, they've uh, boiled it right down to just a wooden dowel for the fuselage because they wanted to go really fast. So they're like, well, what can we get that's got you know, enough stiffness to be a rigid fuselage, but, um, uh, you know, how do we hold the motor on there? So a bit of tape and some, uh, some zap straps hold things in really nice. Uh, anyway, uh, when you start working on these props and this motor combination, because you don't have any mass in the airplane, uh, you can get a thrust to weight ratio of greater than one. Okay, now that's like jet fighters that can accelerate straight upwards, not just fly straight upwards, but actually sit there on their tail and say, oh, yeah, I want to go faster and open the throttle and accelerate perfectly vertical, basically rockets. Or as one of my former high school students said when she saw some of the planes we were building, uh, she was studying it. Uh, uh, computational fluid dynamics at MIT at the time, so she knew what she was talking about. She looks at him and she goes, that's not a plane, that's an ugly helicopter. And ugly helicopters are a great project because uh, they fly nice. Uh, okay, so uh, here's another one of these tools that's come along uh, recently, and uh, I've got some links in this presentation right here. You can get OpenSCAD, and if you go on to Thingiverse, where people share CAD models, uh, somebody named Bouncy Monkey has posted a parametric multi-blade prop generator. I'm just going to give you a quick view of uh, what that looks like, and here is a parametric multi-blade prop generator. Now, this kind of works like, well, uh, other CAD solid modeling programs, except instead of going in and dragging and dropping and building things from uh, sketches and extrusions, you actually come in here and you program what you want it to do. And so if you take a look at the parametric multi-blade prop generator, you can see that, uh, uh, Mr. or Mrs. Monkey uh, has, maybe Dr. Monkey, I don't know, uh, has come in here and put in a whole bunch of parameters, which then come down here and you've got your airfoil points in here 
and it plots this out and it gives uh, instructions to the software on how to build this parametrically. It's really interesting. But best of all, because of the way they've got it set up, you can come in here and you can adjust these parameters. So if you want a pitch of three inches instead of four and a half, you can just type in three. I'm not sure why that font change happened all on there. Um, you can reduce the diameter. Nine inches would be way too big for any prop that we wanted to make. We might bring that down to four inches. Uh, you can make a three-bladed prop if you want. And uh, as you go through and uh, start setting all this up, then there is a button on here, and it's been a while since I've used this, um, to generate that preview. And there you go. It adjusts and adapts that propeller to the parameters that you want. And uh, so anyway, you can come in here and uh, you can adjust that and tweak that. And I'm not quite sure why it's doing that on my monitor. But anyway, um, you can get a prop that you want. You can export that as an STL file, and then you can th try 3D printing it. Now, one of the things to watch when you're 3D printing, of course, is that if you make your propeller blade too flat, that you do have to worry about support material underneath the blade. So we do want to get a quality print, and it is important that the blade come out nice and smooth. So that is one of the uh, challenges in 3D printing is how do you get good support material. Anyway, you can get an STL, you can export it into Cura, and you can uh, 3D print propellers. That's one way to make them. Probably not the fastest, but uh, it certainly lets you get a wide range of parameters. And like I say, if one of those props touches the ground while it's spinning, um, face shields, very important uh, for this. Not Face shields plus glasses because those bits go everywhere and it's not just the people standing near the plane anybody within about 10 or 15 feet is going to see little bits of uh, PLA prop flying at them when that goes into the ground okay now your wings yeah there we go uh, are also going to be an important part of your airplane and again some of those uh, terms the cord so from your leading edge to the trailing edge of your wing and there's some graphics for that in the handouts the camber is how curved it is the angle of attack you know when you're driving along in a car and you put your hand out the window it surfs along really easily and you don't feel much force until you start changing the angle of attack and as you're going into the wind like that all of a sudden you can feel your hand being lifted up because the air is hitting right here and being deflected downwards every action has an equal and opposite reaction when you deflect air downwards your hand has to be pushed upwards okay uh span the length from wingtip to wingtip uh the thickness usually expressed as a percentage of the cord again you'll see these terms coming up i'm just throwing them out there because it is important to know that there is technical terminology that before you start doing this project with students you should probably be up to date on there's also one that you'll see come up that we're kind of gonna ignore but as you delve a bit deeper and as you get students who are more interested in this and maybe heading on a university path, they might start to ask questions about what is this Reynolds number? And uh, it's a really interesting thing. It's a, uh, we call it a non-dimensional number in engineering. And it's a way of taking the fluid density, viscosity, and velocity all into account. And when you do that, uh, your density, of course, will be uh, grams per cubic centimeter or whatever you're dealing with. Um, your viscosity, eh, I forget the units on that one, and your velocity, meters uh, per second. When you put all of those together and multiply them out, all of the meters, kilograms, and uh, seconds and all that cancel each other out. You come out with one number. And this number describes the behavior of an airfoil at that particular Reynolds number. What that allows us to do is to simplify a large airplane wing going through, uh, uh, going through air at a certain speed. And in some cases, you can make a smaller model of that going through water, a much, much more viscous and dense liquid uh, at a slower speed. 
and the behavior of the air over top of your small model will behave the exact or behavior of the water going over your small model will behave the same way as the air going over your large model because uh, the Reynolds number happens to be the same because all these other factors have canceled canceled out anyway um, uh, we're, we're dealing with fairly low Reynolds numbers here for uh, for a wing and for a plane because it's small and it's relatively slow. And so we're looking at somewhere, if you see a Reynolds number in the 50,000 to 150,000 range when we're talking about our wings, that will give you a better result than if you're looking at a multiple million uh, Reynolds number, which is what you'd see on, say, a real airplane. Okay, um, modeling a wing. Uh, NASA has a really neat educational website and uh, just gonna bring up the Foil Sim student website right here. So that uh, when it comes time to model a wing, uh, let's see right here. Oh, yes, perfect. Uh, so the NASA Foil Sim is back up and running now. It uh, it was Java based so that when we went through a whole bunch of Java security issues, this was offline for about a decade. Uh, things you can do with this. Well, first of all, you can choose English or metric units. And of course, we'll choose metric because they're vastly superior. And uh, let's take a look. We can change the size to a certain extent. OK, so the cord is the distance from the leading edge to the trailing edge. And when we make our plane, you know, you could have a 10 centimeter cord more likely you're going to have like a 20 centimeter cord, maybe a 15 centimeter cord. Uh, you can play around with that to see the different results that happen. Now, unfortunately, our span, which is, you know, wingtip to wingtip, so way out here to way out here, um, is limited. We can only go down to about five meters. You're really uh, going to have a wing that's like 50 centimeters. So this is going to come out about 10 times bigger than what you're actually dealing with, but that's okay. Um, you just have to remember that when you take a look at your drag figures and your lift figures up here, that this is for a wing that's 10 times as large. Okay, so you can set up the overall size of the wing that you're looking at. Uh, you can come in here and uh, let's see, in our analysis, it can do a stall model, which is what we want, because when you go too steep, you do want that wing to stall. And you can pretty much, um, leave uh, all of this running. Now you can put just plain streamlines on here where you see the pattern of the air going over top of it. Uh, I like the moving because it lets us know that things are going over top of it. You can take a look. Uh, the 3D view is not that great. 2D view works. Uh, you can do a CSV, which is a, an output file so that you can get all the coordinates for that airfoil. And uh, in the handout, it talks about how to use that to actually turn this into a nice uh, drawing of your wing. Uh, what else have we got in here? You've got your gauges. So we're going to use that to take a look at lift and drag. Uh, there's some information on the airfoil. There's the geometry that you'd output in your CSV. Uh, what else have we got in here? Your shape of your airfoil. We're going to play around with that. And we're going to take a look at our lift and drag on there. The last thing we need to do is we need to change the flight. You are not going to have this plane flying at 160 kilometers an hour. We're going to take it down. And let's put it at something reasonable. Usually planes are tethered electric planes will fly at somewhere around 30 to 40 kilometers an hour. Uh, I have seen them get up to 70 kilometers an hour. Okay, and our altitude in Vancouver, we're down at uh, sea level, so you can leave that pretty much at zero. But uh, if you're doing this in Calgary or somewhere or up in the interior of BC, you might want to tweak that up a little bit because you might be up at 500 meters, and that will affect your performance a little bit. That drops your air density, and so the, uh, the plane flies slightly different. It won't be that big of a deal. Okay. Um, so we've got that set up, and uh, again, there's more information on the handouts. Come in and take a look at the shape right here. And what you can see right now is that this airfoil is not generating any lift whatsoever. 
Okay, and that would be a problem because if you don't have lift, your airplane is not going to get in the air. Uh, all you're getting is drag. Now, right in here, it says uh, that you're generating, uh, what are we around here, one newton of drag, uh, pretty efficient airfoil, actually. There's your numbers right up there, one newton of drag. Let's see what happens when we change the angle of attack. Uh, okay, oh, I went downwards, so now we're generating negative. Uh, let's come in this way. And here we go. Uh, as we start to increase the angle of attack, drag this up a few more degrees, and you can see the angle of attack is increasing this way. Um, our lift is starting to go up, and our drag hasn't gone up all that much. Okay. Of course, because uh, the air is now hitting this and we're deflecting some of the air downwards, that is going to induce drag on this wing. And also when you look at it, the top edge of our wing to the very bottom as we rotate it upwards starts to increase. So we're increasing the cross-sectional area as we go into the uh, wind. Let's uh, increase that a little bit more. And there we go. Now we're... Uh, now we're starting to at 10 degrees. You're also starting to see a little bit of uh, separation on there. And somewhere in here, if you keep going too far, you'll see the drag start to really jack up. When you get that separation on there, your wing's starting to go into stall. And this wing somewhere right in here is going into stall. Now, uh, this says that we're getting 53 Newtons of lift which is way more lift than we need, okay? Uh, our airplanes will typically weigh around 100 grams. So 100 grams is one-tenth of a kilo. That's pretty close to one Newton. So this air uh, performance might be good for heavy lift if you're able to sustain the three Newtons of drag plus the fuselage drag uh, that you're going to be getting on here from your prop. Because uh, three Newtons works out to be about 300 grams of thrust that you'd need to overcome this drag at this speed. And as you'll see, getting 100 grams of thrust out of your prop, we're going to do some static testing of your props, getting 100 newtons of thrust is a challenge. So try to keep your drag down close to one. And actually, you can keep your lift down close to one if you're just trying to get an airplane up in the air. Okay, so you really don't need much of an angle of attack with a symmetric airfoil. Now, if you want to go to uh, a different shape, you can go to a flat-bottomed airfoil. Okay, and now uh, let's bring that angle of attack down a little bit. You can see even with a zero-degree angle of attack, okay, a flat-bottomed airfoil is going to direct some of that air downwards. And this is where Bernoulli's effect starts to come in. Didn't really have that big of a deal in the symmetric airfoil. But uh, as we start to whip the air over the top of edge of the wing, we generate low pressure area on the top. And uh, we, f we find that we can start to get some uh, different behavior. Generally, your flat bottomed airfoils, you'll see those more on uh, like de Havilland beavers, the short takeoff and landing, uh, lower speed airplanes that you see going around. Private airplanes tend to have a flat bottom airfoil. Um, yeah, very, very good airfoil. Uh, you can also switch to a high camber, and the camber is this um, curvature right in here, and you can see that that's uh, jacked our. Uh, both our lift and our drag up. We're getting massive lift and quite a bunch of drag on here, so we might want to reduce that camber a little bit. And by playing around with these numbers, you might be able to come into a situation where you can say, oh, I've got a really optimal airfoil that I really happen to like. And at the Reynolds numbers that we're dealing with, you're actually not too far off to just go with a flat plate and try playing around with that as well. So anyways, NASA's foil sim, and you'll see more about this in the handouts about designing an airfoil, is a useful way to get data uh, for your design. Okay, so like I say, you'll be getting a handout with that. and I've got handouts available um, in the conference files. I'll, uh, well, this is up on YouTube, so it's hard to link to a file just from there, but I'll try and find a way to get these out for people. 
Okay, so uh, there's also a way that you can go in and, you know, if you're doing this with senior students and you want to talk about a more technical engineering approach rather than using FOIL sim, which is great and a fabulous interactive introduction, I love it for the grade nines and tens, is uh, there's a website called Airfoil Tools. I have a handout on how to use that. You can go on and take a look at computational fluid dynamics apps for, uh, for phones and tablets and so wind tunnel is one name that you'll find on there there's lots of neat stuff coming out for the mobile as well okay um, ultimately what you'll do is you'll get a cross section that you desire for your wing and what we would do uh, is we'd use uh, just pencil and paper and we draw these cross sections out and then I'd make a photocopy of them for the students so they could put them down on a piece of uh, hardboard or medium density fiberboard and then they could use the bandsaw and uh, disc sander, belt sander, hand sander, whatever you want, files work great to make two templates. One will be the top template right along here and that will be used to guide our hot wire cutter over each end of the wing. So you'll have a template at this end and a template at this end of your wing. And when you put the hot wire cutter in there, you'll go and guide it right over top of the top side. And that will come in here and that will separate your styrofoam into the top part and this bottom part down here. And then you'll make a bottom template for your wing. And then you'll come in here and you'll cut along this way and come out at that end and that will leave this chunk in the middle between the top cut and the bottom cut to become your wing, okay? So when you go to do this, you need two upper templates, two lower templates, it's covered in the handouts. Um, and when you go and put them on the end of your piece of styrofoam to cut your wing, you have to make sure they're both pointing in the same direction. I've had plenty of wings generated over the years with a leading edge on this corner and a leading edge on that corner. And no, they don't actually work well as a helicopter blade either. Um, so I'm not going to demonstrate cutting a wing with hot wire cutter right here because I'm at home and the hot wire cutter is in at work. But uh, uh, Nichrome wire is a resistance wire. We've talked about it a little bit in our electronics classes. You can find it online and uh, you just put it between uh, uh, like a little bow saw setup, and uh, there you go. Once you've cut your wing, you reinforce it with packing students, uh, packing tape, and uh, unless you're doing heavy lift, uh, a lot of students tend to make their wings too big. You can get away with a fairly small wing. In fact, if you find a little piece of veneer about, I don't know, 12 inches long by about three inches deep sitting around in the shop. You might even be able to uh, curve that and sand it down into a nice wing. Uh, or you can go old school and go out and find some balsa wood and do some really nice work with that. Uh, you can make your fuselage a number of ways. You can use a piece of dowel as you saw in there. Not exactly the most beautiful, but it works and it gets things done. Uh, or you can uh, carve things out of styrofoam. Uh, um, and tuck the motor right into it, all sorts of ways to do it. Elastic bands are great for holding your land, landing gear in place and a little bit of thin welding rod works great, especially if you've got aluminum welding rod, works beautifully uh, for making your landing gear. Uh, you do need the landing gear in order to keep your propeller from smacking into the ground repeatedly as your airplane tries to take off. And then uh, nine volt battery clips tend to work really well for connecting and disconnecting the airplane from the tether pole, okay? Now, just as I was talking about strain relief at the tether, we do have a strain relief um, at, the, uh, at the wing airplane side so that you can hook your wire in over top of that. And the nine volt battery clips are not supporting the uh, force of your airplane because when that airplane gets spinning around inside the class at 50, 60, 70 kilometers an hour, there is enough centripetal force in that line that that airplane is probably putting a couple kilos of force um, onto, the, um, uh, onto the wire and could rip the nine volt battery uh, connection right apart if, uh, if you don't have that hooked up. You will need to design a tail for your airplane. So critical parts of the tail include your rudder uh, and elevator. So vertical stabilizer and horizontal stabilizer if you want the $50 version of the word. And uh, those are 
uh, well, you'll see in some of the examples, uh, pretty important parts because they allow you to fine tune the pitch of your airplane and how it flies. Uh, you'll have to balance your airplane. Uh, I'll balance the wing on two fingers, try and hold it like that, about one third of the way back on the leading edge of the wing. And uh, your center of lift is somewhere around one third of the way back on a regular rectangular uh, airfoil. And that has to be exactly over top of the center of gravity. So you have to slide your wing forwards and backwards to get that to balance nicely, okay? If your plane's gonna rest anything other than perfectly level, in fact, even better than perfectly level, is slightly nose down. Because in most cases, when your propeller starts to pull, that will create a pull along the central axis of your fuselage. And if your wing is on the top of the fuselage, that will create drag up there. And as you generate more and more thrust, and as your plane starts to move faster and faster as a result of that thrust, you'll get drag on the wing, creating a torque where your propeller is pulling you forward and your wing is holding you back. And you'll start to rock the airplane up this way and you'll increase your pitch just a little bit. So slightly nose down, way better than resting slightly nose up because if you rest slightly nose up this airplane's going to take off pick up some speed and that torque will keep rotating it up and your airplane will go straight up for a little while which sounds great fabulous takeoff keep in mind there's a tether cord on there and everything travels in a sphere about that tether so straight up's not always that good the orbit ends poorly all right, so um, you're going to go through, you're going to build the plane, you're going to do a flight test, and uh, we'll show you uh, videos later on and give you some examples about how to uh, get your airplane and get your students' airplanes up in the air. Do not attempt to throw it up in the air like that for the reasons I just got into. Uh, you want it to take off in straight and level flight, okay? Um, now, once your plane's up in the air again, we'll have some video and we'll take a look at the plane flying. In fact, I think I've got some slides coming up for you where we can get a quick idea of what this looks like. Okay, uh, you've got feedback and all sorts of data to check your efficiency. If your power supply displays its uh, voltage setting and the current that it's supplying at that voltage setting, well, then you can calculate the power that's going out to the plane. You can have competitions to see who can make their airplane fly with the lowest amount of power, which is a great way to get talking about power being volts and amps and having it fused into students' minds in a way that makes sense to them other than just being a formula. Okay, um, another one I always enjoy is uh, asking the students how they plan to calculate the speed of the plane. It's actually pretty easy. Uh, and uh, so I'm sure you can figure that one out. How to make the plane better? Well, there's all sorts of things. This beautiful masterwork actually created by not just an airplane pilot but uh, and his teammates, but a, hel a helicopter pilot, a uh, very, very talented, engaging uh, uh, man, uh, and had some classmates who were very happy to work along with him. So Arnell, your leadership on that is uh, remembered and amazing. And uh, it was a beautiful, beautiful piece of work. Um, even if it did fly a little too close to the sun sometimes. Uh, so things that you can do to make the plane better. Well, try a different prop, uh, make the tail smaller, make the plane lighter. Uh, as your plane gets in the air, you'll start to look at your airplane and you'll take a look at other people's airplanes and you'll say, well, why is theirs flying better than mine? Why is theirs faster? And all of a sudden you'll start to see the wings start to shrink as people think about the impact of drag and how much lift you actually need to keep this little skeleton up in the air. Or sometimes people People come along and they'll uh, they'll say, oh well, okay, I'm not really concerned about being the fastest. I want to be the coolest. And uh, so uh, the LED strips under the wing, beautiful picture right here of the plane zipping around one of our shops uh, with an LED strip under the ring, illuminating the floor, uh, creating this beautiful glow in flight as it goes. Uh, we had one. Uh, team of students, they were insistent that they were going to make a twin. And as you can see, 
Well, actually, I've got better video than this. This was how it ended up. You can see the shattered 3D printed props on here. Bits flew everywhere, bounced off the ceiling, literally. Um, and uh, so there's all sorts of things you can do with this project to get creative and make a cool tethered electric airplane. But uh, here is one. I tried to talk these guys out of baking a twin. I told them all sorts of reasons why it wouldn't work. And... Now, you'll notice that the pitch of this airplane is very nose up, giving it a very high angle of attack, massive amounts of drag, but they had enough thrust to overcome all that. And that's what those beautiful props looked like before they smashed into the ground and uh, ended up getting, uh, get, getting shredded. Uh, just a minute here. Do we have a different one flying in here? This is the one I started out with. This is what a more typical tethered airplane looks like. You'll notice that we've got a lot of weight on the base here, and the tether pole is swaying back and forth right in here. Again, the centripetal force on there. You can understand now maybe why the uh, strain relief is so uh, so critical on there. So uh, I think those guys might have been the fastest. They were up. 50 or 60 kilometers an hour, I think. Um, and really, uh, it must, you, you can see the students have uh, eye protection on. Uh, they probably could have done with uh, uh, face shields as well on top of that. Uh, let's see. Oh, and then here we go. Here's with a little bit of underglow. That one's carrying some extra weight that's not quite as well balanced as the last plane, but uh, I think they're also diverting some of their power into their lighting system. So kind of makes for a more impressive uh, photograph, really, than video. But uh, kind of a neat idea to see that flying around the classroom as well. That goes on for a little ways. I don't know if it does anything too much more exciting than that. And uh, here we go, this beautiful stick-built wing. Uh, one of the things that you do need to uh, keep in mind when you're doing this project is that this is an iterative design. You're going to have um, you're going to have some crashes. You're going to have some smashes. So if you make your first plane too beautiful, um, or your first try too beautiful, when it breaks, you're not just going to be able to go ahead and put a bit of tape around it and throw it back up in the air and try it again. This design really is, I guess, in a way, a rapid prototyping concept because what you come away with is not always a beautiful design that you want to hold on to and put up on your shelf and say, I made this awesome thing. Uh, because some of them don't look that nice by the time they're all done. This one looked beautiful before it started flying. But it needed a little bit more thrust because that wing was so big and as soon as it started to go up there it had so much drag that it just lifted itself right up in the air and flipped right over on its back. Uh, if they'd had a bit more chance to get this all worked up and running, they would have really, really had a cool and beautiful design. And so here we are down in the auto shop. This is a previous year with another plane just whipping around here. Again, going a little too fast for you to see too much about the plane. But it's coming in for a landing there. And like I say, they've got to be durable and tough because they are... Uh, going to have a rough time on landing sometimes. So anyway, um, we're going to be doing this project. I'll be getting some handouts to you with more information on how it all comes together. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing what you guys come up with.